I can't say that I was looking forward to this meeting, but this is another cross that I have to bear in my profession. The victim of an unsolved crime that had been buried in our files for years asked to speak with an investigator and, well, technically I ended up here. But without witnesses to the crime itself and without any additional evidence that has emerged in the years since the crime was committed, and it is doubtful that they will ever appear, then I was afraid that this case would become one of many that would forever remain among our unsolved files. Mr. Thomas, good morning. Please have a seat, I said when the gentleman was shown into my office. Good morning, Sergeant. He answered officially, placing his briefcase on the floor next to him and sitting down on the chair I indicated. Well, sir, I understand that you are wondering if we have made any progress in your case. Yeah. Well, I'm just a little curious. I looked at the unimpressively thin folder of papers lying on the table in front of me. At one time, I was not part of the original investigative team, but in preparation for this meeting, I carefully studied the documents. However, he understood that this would be a meeting between a helpless detective and a victim for whom he could do nothing. As far as I could tell, the investigators had asked all the right questions and looked into all the right dark corners at the time. The problem was that all I could tell him was literally, there are no leads, a phrase that I almost said during the meeting. I thought it best to briefly summarize the matter and what we have, and then let Peter Thomas ask all the questions he wants. Only I doubted that he would come up with something that he had not already been asked about many times. For reasons we cannot determine, and because of your injuries you cannot remember, I added, throwing a quick glance across the table at Thomas. On the morning of Tuesday, April 14th, you left your office at approximately 10.30, we have no idea where you went or why. However, by half past twelve or so, you found yourself on the landing of the lower level of a parking lot in the city center. Two ladies. By the way, their parking ticket was issued at 11.22. We're entering the stairwell on the fifth level, we believe, at 11.30, when they heard what they quite correctly believed to be several gunshots. Frightened by the sounds, they ran back to the fifth level, and called the police on their mobile phones. Officers arrived on the scene at 11.40, and you were quickly found lying on the landing between the first and second levels with three bullet wounds, one in the head and two in the chest. Your wallet, watch, rings, car keys, and even change from your pockets were stolen. No one saw your attacker or attackers or anyone else acting suspiciously in the parking lot, either before or after you were attacked. I'm sorry to say this, Mr. Thomas, but there was very little interest there. I've read the dossier, and to be perfectly honest with you, sir, there were no witnesses. So we have nothing to go on. So you stopped looking? Oh, no, sir. The case remains open. And if the weapon... By the way, it was a thirty-five caliber automatic pistol. Probably what Americans like to call a Saturday night special. A cheap pocket pistol. Not particularly powerful, and to that fact alone, you probably owe your life. But if those weapons turn up, or are used again in another crime, well then, at least we'll have something to start with. These street robberies are very difficult nuts to crack, Mr. Thomas. If a criminal uses the same modus operandi on a regular basis, then there is a chance that we can link several cases together and come up with something. Street robberies with guns are rare in this country anyway. In your case, we strongly suspect that most likely the gun went off by mistake and the perpetrator panicked when he realized he had hit you. If he has any sense, he probably threw the weapon in the river or something. But the case remains open in the archives. So you stop looking? He repeated. Well, I don't see what else we can do other than what was done at the time, Mr. Thomas. I replied, looking again at the open folder. Then for some reason, probably to remind myself that the investigators came to a dead end. I flipped through a couple of pages. Whenever a new investigator comes to the department, he looks at all the existing open cases with fresh eyes. Well, you know, I came to you myself last year. We were hoping that you might be able to remember some details of your movements that morning. But as you know, we studied. I quickly changed my mind and said something different from what I had intended. We studied everyone who might have a grudge against you, but there was nothing there. We even went so far as to contact insurance companies to find out if it was 
but the only major policy in your life was not suspicious in nature. You only took out too many years ago to cover your mortgage and, well, the same standard policy that I took out in my own life to take care of my family if something unexpected happened. Sir, the officers on the case at the time could do absolutely nothing. They were forced to conclude that this was just a random robbery. I'm sorry, but I have to admit that Unless some further evidence comes to light that shows that this is not the case, I very much doubt that the case will ever be solved. After carefully reading the report, I truly felt sorry for this man. The three wounds he received were serious, and if the weapon had been of a larger caliber, the one inflicted on his head would certainly have been fatal. Be that as it may, he remained in a coma for three years, on life support, and doctors assured him that he would never come out of it. In fact, after eight months and by court order, the life support machine was turned off. But Peter Thomas surprised the charlatans by continuing to breathe. However, they said that with such little brain activity. Well, the doctors thought that he would remain in a coma forever. And even if he did wake up, he would probably be little more than a head of cabbage. At one time, an attempt was made to obtain a court order allowing Peter Thomas to be taken off life support. But this was denied. Nowhere in the file was it stated who applied for the order, nor was there any indication of who or what organization objected to it. Unfortunately, from a police officer's perspective, there is rarely an aha moment in this scenario. Debates often involve a variety of people on both sides, family members, doctors, and even hospital management, or to be more precise and hidden behind a lot of chatter, their accountants, can all influence the decision to apply for such an order. After two years, even his family seemed to have given up hope that Peter Thomas would ever regain consciousness. While visiting her husband in the hospital, his wife apparently became friends with a man named William Bowman. Bowman's wife was admitted to the same hospital with acute liver failure caused by excessive self-administration of paraacetylaminophenol. This is a routine paracetamol tablet for the likes of you and me and the most common cause of liver failure in the UK and many other countries I can think of. Apparently it wasn't a suicide attempt or anything like that. By all accounts, Bowman's wife was a bit of a hypochondriac and, well, let's just say a little delicate mentally and at the same time she was quite a vulnerable person. It was established, yes, the officers in the Thomas case were considering all possible options, even at this late stage, that William Bowman's wife had accidentally overdosed on paracetamol. There was nothing in the files to indicate when exactly the affair began between William Bowman and Mrs. Thomas, and there is no indication that William Bowman and Mrs. Thomas even knew of each other's existence before they encountered each other at the long-term care facility. However, after Bowman's wife died, he and Mrs. Thomas began to keep in touch. Bowman often sat with Mrs. Thomas at her husband's bedside during her long vigils, Eventually, the inevitable happened. They fell in love. Mrs. Thomas divorced her husband and then married Willem Bowman. The officers on the Thomas case took another close look at Bowman and Mrs. Thomas, but could find nothing to indicate that either of them knew of the other's existence until Mrs. Bowman first suffered liver failure. How do I know all this? Because it was all in Peter Thomas's file. Only because we officially considered the attack on him a robbery. This should not be taken to mean that we have turned a blind eye to all other possible scenarios. Another 18 months or almost two years passed before Mr. Thomas, against all medical advice, emerged from his coma. After receiving this news, officers were at his bedside for several hours. But let's start with the fact that Peter Thomas suffered from acute amnesia and remembered very little about his adult life. Over the next months, most of his memories gradually returned. I was glad I wasn't involved with him in this case when he recalled his marriage in detail and, heck, he obviously knew that his wife divorced him while he was in a coma, even before I remembered that they were married. The doc had the pleasure of informing him of this fact. But wasn't I glad I wasn't around during this revelation? So you see, Mr. Thomas, unless a witness or some new evidence turns up somewhere, or you won't recover some memories of what exactly happened on that particular morning. I'm sorry, but I highly doubt we'll ever make any further progress on this matter. 
I was kind of hoping that this would be the end of the interview, but Peter Thomas had a strange look on his face that made me ask, You didn't remember anything else, did you? No, but I think I've found some evidence. Well, I guess you could say I've actually found a witness. He smiled back at me, and then his expression turned grim. Peter Thomas took his briefcase and placed it on his lap. Opening it, he took out a framed photograph and handed it to me for me to look at. I was slightly surprised to find that the photo was of his daughter and her husband on their wedding day. I even thought I remembered seeing her before when I visited their house, getting acquainted with the Thomas case. When taking on a cold case, standard procedure is to re-interview all possible witnesses, just to make sure nothing has been overlooked. Your daughter and her husband. I said so that Peter Thomas would understand that I recognized his daughter. A very beautiful young lady. Thank you. What do you think of the jewelry she's wearing? Dear ones, real diamonds, aren't they? Yes, my wife. At least fifty grand at today's prices. Impressive. I hope they are in a safe place. I had a second safe hidden in my house to store them. I bought the pendant for my wife for our fifth wedding anniversary. Lucky girl, my wife would kill for such a pendant. The strange expression appeared on Mr. Thomas's face again. For our tenth anniversary, I ordered matching earrings. Very impressive. They must have cost a fortune. Yes, they were worth it, but not as much as the necklace I made for our 15th anniversary. The tiara my daughter is wearing is actually a necklace attached to a wire frame. When worn as a necklace, a pendant can be attached to it using a small clip. Or, as you can see, the pendant can be worn separately on a separate chain. Very easy to attach, and must have been made by an experienced craftsman, I commented. Of course, the little man who has a workshop in Monk Street. Coleman, do you know him? I heard about him, Mr. Thomas. But with my salary, it's unlikely that my wife will ever find any of his things in her jewelry box, I replied with a smile. I completely understand, and I'm very sorry. In any case, these jewelry that my daughter is wearing are my witnesses. I'm sorry? I had no idea what Peter Thomas meant. Well, you see, Sergeant, my wife lent this piece to our daughter so she could wear it on her wedding day. As you know, I've settled down pretty well over the years, and my wife had plenty of other jewelry that she could wear, but still couldn't outshine the bride on her wedding day, could she? I nodded in agreement with Peter Thomas, although I had no idea where he was taking me. Sometimes it's better to let people tell it their own way. Unfortunately, before returning the jewelry, my daughter must have tried to attach the pendant back to the necklace and slightly damaged the clip that secured it. I noticed this when I picked up the set to have a look. You know, our 20th anniversary was approaching, and I guess I was wondering if Coleman might be able to add something else to the set. Really a stupid idea. The whole ensemble is already too pretentious. There weren't many occasions when my wife got away with it. Although Lydia likes him, no. There is no need to increase envy. Sorry, sir, but I really don't understand what you're getting at, I finally had to admit. Oh, no, sorry, Sergeant. I haven't shown you this photo yet. Peter Thomas pulled out a second framed photograph from his briefcase and handed it to me. I immediately knew it was a photograph of his ex-wife and William Bowman on their wedding day. Moreover, she was wearing the same jewelry as her daughter in the first photo, except for the pendant that hung from the necklace. You know that since I left the hospital, I have been living on the South Coast. These days, I rarely come to the city and therefore do not visit my daughter's house very often. She usually comes to see me, along with her husband and children, about once a month or so. But a few months ago, they bought a new and much larger house. I had a reason to come into town to see my lawyer to update my will, so I took the opportunity to visit them unannounced. The reason I was at my daughter's house doesn't really matter. The important thing is that my daughter did not expect my arrival and, therefore, as usual, did not remove this photograph of Lydia and her new husband, as she always did before my previous visits. My daughter was a diplomat and knew that seeing a photo of Lydia with him would probably upset me. Peter Thomas suddenly fell silent and stared at the photo of his wife and Bowman's smiling faces for a moment. 
Very beautiful, isn't it, Sergeant? I had to agree with him. But unfortunately, she is also quite vain, and perhaps this will lead to her downfall. Excuse me, Mr. Thomas? Necklace Sergeant, in this photo the pendant is attached to it. I told you the clamp was broken. Come in, Mrs. Tom. Excuse me, Mrs. Bowman, aren't you? Sit down, please. Sergeant, why was I so rudely called here like this? Your officers needlessly embarrassed me at my place of work, she replied, clearly annoyed. My apologies, Mrs. Bowman, but recently certain evidence has emerged of an attempt on the life of your first husband. She was good. I give her credit. However, there was no mistaking the momentary flash of apprehension that flashed across the lady's face before she shot back at me. What are you talking about? Peter was accidentally shot by a robber. I was assured of this by the officers at the time. Based on the evidence they had at the time, that was the most likely scenario, Mrs. Bowman. However, you never know when known evidence or even a new witness suddenly emerging will lead us in a different direction. Or, someone has been considered in the past, even several times, but we did not realize its significance, I replied. I don't understand. I'm sure you'll understand very soon, Mrs. Bowman. I reached out and pressed it the start button on the recorder. Then, out loud for recording, he identified himself and the male officer sitting next to me, taking notes, as well as the time and date, then asked Mrs. Bowman to introduce herself to the microphone. I must say that, in a matter of moments, she went from a very combative woman to a rather anxious one. Having completed the formalities, I showed Mrs. Bowman a copy of the photograph of her and her second husband on their wedding day and asked her to confirm that this was indeed what happened. Yes, of course it is. What does this all mean, Sergeant? She answered. Just some unfinished business that has recently left us a bit confused, Mrs. Bowman. This is what I need to clarify now, that's all. So am I correct in assuming that all the jewelry you are wearing in this photo was bought by your first husband? Yes, for different wedding anniversaries. And is this the same jewelry that your daughter is wearing here, in this photograph? I showed Mrs. Bowman a copy of another photograph that Mr. Thomas had provided us with. Yes, that's right, she assured me. Tell me, Mrs. Bowman... Did you happen to have any reason to wear any of this jewelry during the three months between your daughter's wedding and the time Mr. Thomas was shot? No, my daughter returned them and they were put back in my jewelry safe. Peter installed the safe. He was paranoid that we might get robbed one evening while we were away. Did you wear it at all between your daughter's wedding and yours with William Bowman? Well, yes, after the divorce. I hardly went anywhere while my husband was in the hospital, I may have worn the pendant and earrings a few times when William and I were dating after our divorce. But for the first time, I wore the entire set at our wedding. I really don't understand where you're going with these questions, Sergeant. Well, you see, Mrs. Bowman, I have a problem. I've looked at the documents several times, and nowhere is it mentioned that your husband had a case with this jewelry on him or somewhere nearby when he was found lying on those stairs that day but it brought my attention to the fact that just after 11 in the morning, Peter Thomas picked up the necklace and pendant from jeweler Coleman on Monk Street, the man who originally made it. Apparently your daughter damaged the clasp or something, and Peter Thomas had taken the necklace to Coleman's for repairs a few days before the incident. Mr. Coleman is very diligent in his business, Mrs. Bowman, especially when it comes to 30,000 pounds worth of diamonds. He has a copy of the receipt in his files with a timestamp and date. The question I have to ask you, Mrs. Bowman, is, how did you become the owner of these jewels again? It is believed that Mr. Thomas had a briefcase which he was carrying on the morning he was attacked. One of Coleman's assistants clearly remembers Mr. Thomas putting the jewelry in a briefcase and locking it. However, there is no record of a briefcase being found at the crime scene. Apparently, the criminal stole everything valuable that your ex-husband had with him that day. So, Mrs. Bowman, could you explain how some of the contents of Peter Thomas' briefcase came into your possession? Mrs. Bowman turned very pale and remained silent. I didn't expect her to completely break down and admit everything. But I had a feeling that if I pressed just a little harder, she might do it. Although there is always a danger that I will overpower, 
and she, as the Americans like to say, will attack me with a lawyer. However, I had little hard evidence for me to hope that the woman would crack. So, I chose the murder charge. Lydia Bowman, I am arresting you for the attempted murder of your husband, Peter Henry Thomas. You have the right not to say anything, but it may harm your defense if you do not mention during questioning something that you will later refer to in court. Anything you say can be used against you. In fact, I very much doubted that Lydia pulled the trigger herself. Framing her for a crime was a risky ploy, but I thought it might work. I was lucky and Lydia fell apart almost instantly. No, I didn't shoot him. It was... Who was it, Lydia? William Bowman, I suggested. Yes, it was William's idea. I think he also killed his wife. I didn't expect the implication that Bowman may have killed his wife, but from a logical standpoint, it made sense. I understand. But to make it look like a robbery, he had to take the briefcase and only later did you discover that it also contained your diamonds. Yes. I had no idea that Peter took them with him or why. None of you knew that Peter went shopping for jewelry that morning, did you? You didn't even know that your daughter damaged the clasp. Peter thought he would sneak it in for repairs without you even realizing. Your daughter damaged it. No, Bill found the jewelry box later when he went to put a brick in his briefcase for the sake of weight. He was going to throw it into the river, and he couldn't bring himself to throw away 30,000 pounds. I wouldn't let him. Do you know what William Bowman did with the gun? No, I have no idea, although... But what, Lydia? Bill has a storage room somewhere. The apartment is not registered in his name and he pays rent in cash. I have no idea what he keeps there. Whether we'll find a gun in this vault is anyone's guess. But I'm pretty sure we'll still get a conviction on Mrs. Bowman's second confession. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one.